And just like that, the Seahawks are on top of the NFC West, just as we all suspected. We've got Monday Night Football, we've got Reporters, Waiver Wire Day for your fantasy needs, and Surfing Lessons with Matt Money Smith via Cundillos People. Let's go. Oh my goodness, Russell Wilson making his Broncos debut in Seattle with 12s, maybe the loudest I've ever heard them, where he himself won a Super Bowl, where he himself spent the first 10 years of his career and then loses with the ball not in his hands, 17 to 16 in true heartbreaking fashion. And the heartbreak for me, is mostly for the Broncos fans, and we'll get into that. But let's talk about those Broncos. Cecil Lamy joining us right now. He covers the Broncos side of things for 104.3, the fan in Denver. We go way back with fantasy football love, of course. But let's get right into it, Cecil. Nathaniel Hackett, uh, a new head coach, pulling the bizarro Dable and taking the ball out of Russell Wilson's hands at the end of the game. Uh, how's that going over? Yeah, not going over real well in Nathaniel Hackett in his debut. And what was a must win? I know it's week one. Don't overreact, but I'm overacting. It was a must win for the Denver Broncos. It has been so awful here for six years, Kay. 11 different starting <laughs> quarterbacks, and you're I supposed know. to fix it with Russell Wilson. You're supposed to let him cook, and there's too many cooks in the kitchen because Nathaniel Hackett's doing the rookie head coach thing and not knowing how to finish out a game. You have Russell Wilson. You have three timeouts. You have plenty of time. Let Russell Cook, let him win, let him win this game and let him do what Pete Carroll wouldn't let him do, which was Cook. That's the whole reason you made this move and you, you know, <laughs> push away your future. <laughs> I'm so upset I can't even talk. Like, I get it. I get mortgage it. Mortgage your future for this guy. Let him go out there and win your game. Okay, well, let's, okay, I'll say this. You know what else? I, I was thinking about Broncos fans this morning. Uh, a tortured fan base of late. There's the whole you don't have a quarterback thing and then when you finally get when you take the ball out of his hands like you're saying, there's also the frustration. One of the, the one things about Vic Fangio that was criticized probably the most was his inability in end game situations to sort of manage right. what's going on. And then you think, oh, maybe we have a different change of pace and we got this left ride mentality and it doesn't happen. So it's super frustrating. I will say, I let, you know, this was an emotional game. We could almost throw Very this one so. out, potentially, right? So I liked the connection with Judy, seeing some of those things happen. Uh, what are your thoughts as we go forward with the Broncos? Yeah, as you go forward with the Broncos, learn from your mistakes and move on. But know that in the AFC, you don't have any room for error. Like you, the end of the schedule gets really difficult when you face the Chiefs twice. You know, when you're facing teams like the Ravens, the Titans later on in this season, you've got to be able to get it done better. The Colts coming up in week five, that'll be a tough game. So learn from these mistakes, move on, but let Russ cook. And listen, if you're Nathaniel Hackett, you're happy fun coach, right? Yeah. Well, maybe know how to motivate your guys differently without being happy fun because things weren't fun last night at the end of the game and they're not fun in Broncos country right now. Yeah. And I mean, Russell will this is as this morning even saying, you know, Nathaniel Hackett made the right decision. We, we know he he's doing that company man thing that he does, which is why we love Russell Wilson. And everyone's like, oh, of course he did. But I think he should get some credit for not, you know, he could easily come out and say, I wish I had the ball in my hands. I know a lot of quarterbacks that are great and have won Super Bowls who would say the same. So I like that they're at least on the same page. And I know how much affection and to use the word affection as a coach for a quarterback I spoke to Nathaniel Hackett about this when the move happened and he's like it's Russell Wilson and I kept playing that in my head last night trying to fall asleep where he was so excited almost uh, like in a fanatical way as a fan like it's Russell Wilson right. I get to go play with this toy and this is a guy who was you know, hanging out with Aaron Rodgers year and year out so uh, I was surprised that that was the decision they made and then the whole time out thing was absolutely brutal but uh, we're going to take some positives away from this performance and we're going to hear you lament about it, Lammy, uh, over on 104.3 The Fan in Denver. Thank you so much for being here on the show. I want tweets from Denver fans. I know you are feeling some kind of way this morning, at Up and Adams, or me, of course, at Hey K Adams, and maybe we'll make you feel better. Maybe we'll get some of your tweets on the air as we look at the Seahawks side of things, which I actually find to be more compelling and interesting because I love an underdog story as we welcome in Seahawks beat writer for the Tacoma News Tribune. Welcome to the show, Greg Bell. Greg, how are you? Well, good morning. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're a little different than uh, C. Salami on the other side. How are you feeling this morning? <laughs> 
Well, I'm not a fan, actually. I'm from Ohio. I'm a Steeler fan. I was born and raised outside Pittsburgh. But it's, the city is completely different than I thought they'd be this morning. They weren't expecting Geno Smith to go 17 for 18. Who was? Smith probably wasn't expecting that. 13 completions in a row to start the game. Two touchdown passes. He was out playing Wilson into the third quarter. And then Wilson started taking over, I thought. He was taking advantage of the, of the blitzes and the pressure that Seattle was trying to bring, throw it to where the blitzers were coming from. And they really did. Denver had the upper hand, except for two plays near the goal line. That The, the crowd affected the game, okay? There's no other ways 100%. about it. It's, Echenna Wosu got off the snap and beat the, the tackle outside on both plays. They, Denver fumbled on the goal line because Denver had to go to a silent count the entire game because of the noise. Echenna and Wosu, the outside linebacker who came in from the Chargers this offseason, I thought won the game. He with was those two so good. Goal Incredible performance by Wosu. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the, you know, how the players are sort of reacting, where we go from here with the Seattle side. It's not, maybe not repeatable for Geno Smith, but I would absolutely champion uh, a nice resurgence for this quarterback who everybody wrote off. It's very hard to rewrite your history in the NFL. Eight years since he last had his full time. Barack Obama was the president. TikTok hadn't even been invented yet, Kay. <laughs> the last time Geno Smith was a quarterback. Wow. He said last night he felt validated, but that he always has felt validated because of his work and how he stuck with it, and he knew he'd get another chance. But as I said, it was way above his and everybody in Seattle's expectation. And Pete Carroll's expectation, he would start 13 for 13, 17 for 18 passing and two touchdowns. They were running the ball early enough, well enough, to set up play action pass and do the things Seattle wants to do. Their defense was swarming and playing well enough to keep that lead. Mm -hmm. I thought it was really important, Kay, that Seattle got the lead early to take advantage of the crowd noise and the advantage that they had starting. And they scored three and a half minutes into the game on a Geno Smith, a really good play by Smith that looked like he was taken off to run, avoiding pressure. And right before the line of scrimmage, flips the little pass out to the tight end, Will Disley, for the touchdown. And so three and a half minutes in, all the booing that had started two yeah. hours before kickoff continued. And because Seattle played from the front the entire game, the noise stayed that way and the intensity stayed that way. Denver never led in that game. And I think that contributed to how loud and, and it was as loud as the 2014 season. It NFC felt loud. Season. It, was, it really was. I, I've been in that stadium for every game the last decade, and that was wow. the loudest in eight years I've been. Were you surprised about the booing? How did you feel about the booing? I was surprised at the intensity, and uh, there were a lot of Bron Broncos fans in the stands. You probably saw it on television. There was a lot of orange in the lower deck. But I was surprised by how intense and how sustained it was. I mean, the first fans in the game at 3.15 Pacific time yesterday, two hours before kickoff, they were booing Russell Wilson. He was sweat clothes just going through early pregame. Mm. Look, there'll be a time, Kay, when he comes back and he'll be in the ring of honor and totally. he will get honored. Absolutely. And there, there are a lot of people that aren't football fans that appreciate Russell Wilson, people at Children's Hospital where he went every Tuesday for 10 years and the families that he affected there and the academy that he started in South King County. And I could go on and on and rightly so, of what he's done here, both on and off the field, the only Super Bowl champion quarterback. He will be honored for that. And he will always be in Seahawks yeah. history, the, the best quarterback. Last night was not the time for that. Yeah. And there are only 16 NFL games. You have the competitive part of Pete Carroll. That's why he basically dared the fans to boo, because he you got to win games and have the opportunities to to beat him on his first game back after he basically injured his it's way out. It's a compliment. They, they didn't want him to leave. They're booing because it wasn't like they said, get out of here, start. You know, it wasn't uh, he, he wanted out. They wanted him to stay. And I think all will be well when he eventually decides to hang it up and takes uh, his victory tour, which he deserves for what he's done, did there, of course, in the community, as you so eloquently mentioned, uh, and on the field. What did you make of the, you know, did you see Pete Carroll and him? I was watching very closely. I like the drama. I do. I'll admit it. I didn't see any interaction between those two. Uh, anything, any other insights that you saw? I saw the embrace from DK Metcalf, of course. I know that Geno Smith and he have a close relationship as Gino's been there since 2019, watching him and now taking over. So uh, it was beautiful to see that, a sign of respect. But there were some weird tweets going around from, you know, Richard Sherman and Doug Baldwin. What did you make of that? Well, on the field after the game, you're right, Kate. At least six, eight Seahawks hugged Russell Wilson. Wilson talked briefly, very briefly with Pete Carroll right at the end of the game. Okay. With a bunch of cameramen around him and 
I asked Carol what he said to Wilson, and he said, nice game. And it was that in his, that brief. He hugged Quandre Diggs. He hugged DJ Metcalf. He congratulated Tyler Lockett for getting engaged this past weekend. He knelt in prayer in a circle with a bunch of Seattle players right at midfield. Uh, it was extended. It, it was There were a lot of people talking to him. It wasn't like he was persona non grata out there. Or, no, there, After the game, Wilson said, yeah, winning matters, and this game matters, and I wanted to win. But friends matter, too. And that's hard for fans, of course, to understand because they root for the jersey and the, and the Seahawks colors and how dare he spurn us and go to Denver. That doesn't mean that Pete Carroll and D.K. Metcalf and Tyler Lockett right. are going to quit liking a guy that they spent right. so much time on and off the field for 10 years. So I, the, I, right after the game on the field was emblematic of that. One thing I do want to mention that you brought up with the previous guest that end game was inexplicable, and the Seahawks could not believe it and were so thankful that they didn't have to defend Wilson for five yards with the game on line. They were – Carroll said he was – he couldn't – he was totally surprised, and Wilson said he was shocked, and perhaps it's – well, perhaps they didn't trust him in that situation. But to just have Wilson standing there, your $254 yeah. million dollar quarterback, and let 40-some seconds go off the clock with three timeouts – a 64-yard field goal kick, that, that would have been the second longest successful field goal in NFL I hear history. you. Everybody's saying <laughs> it. I keep looking for the opposite take. I keep looking, you know, every uh, was there any reason that this would have been the right decision or the right move? And I can't seem to find that one. So uh, you're with everybody on that one. But I appreciate the Seahawks enjoying that. And we'll see. Are they a playoff team? Maybe. Jamal Adams losing him is never fun. I think the defense is where I have some questions. But uh, either way, if Russell Wilson bounces back after this win, what a story. And takes the Broncos to the promised land. Or if the Seahawks keep things going uh, unheralded and untalked about all offseason, I'm here for both. Greg Bell, a Seattle beat or Seahawks beat writer for the Tacoma News. Tribune, we appreciate you for joining us. Uh, it, listen, the Broncos blew a bunch of opportunities in this one. 12 penalties for 106 yards. And I credit the 12s for that as we're hearing how loud they were out there. I liked the Judy connection with the Broncos. I'm trying to you know, make some happy things happen here. Javante, I, I liked that. Javante Williams, I liked seeing him getting in the mix in the passing game as well. That's a little bit new. So there's some things to be excited about that. They had opportunities in this game, and it didn't pan out. Now, I feel for Broncos fans because of the whole Vic Fangio thing. I already sort of went into that. They haven't had a great quarterback in a long time, all of that. Let's wait. I do think the emotions were so high on both sides. You saw all of the post-game stuff uh, after, so we just sort of have to let that settle and see how it goes. But the real bright spot here is just to stop for a minute, and sometimes you just have to celebrate what just happened, and that's Gino. Tannehill's second act, question mark? Mwah, chef's kiss. I'm here for it. He was near perfect to start the game. 23 of 28, 195 yards, two touchdowns. Going back to last year, over his last five games, he had thrown seven touchdowns, just one interception. And he'd completed over 70% of his passes. With those receivers and with that run game, when I told you guys about Rashad Penny and how he'd start running and how they used him, I'm not convinced they won't be competitive in the NFC. I mean, they run the West right now after one game. He's been there since 2019. Gino knows these receivers. Gino knows this offense. They're going to run more. So if he can bring this sort of efficiency, I'm totally here for that. Now, I have questions about their defense. I would keep an eye on the Seattle squad, though. And I do, in fact, love this for them. I was in New York in the Geno Smith era and how that went wrong. It is really hard to pull a Tannehill and go from a Miami break right, have a good offensive coordinator. I mean, Pete Carroll seems happy. It seems like Gino wants to listen and sort of be, you know, part of that offense and, and do all the right things. Uh, and it's, it's a really refreshing thing to see. As for Russell Wilson, I will not count him out ever. Emotional week one. That only means he can go up from here as we bring in a very special guest, a former NFL quarterback with the Jets and the Seahawks. Hey, currently, let me get this right. Russell Wilson's full-time personal quarterback coach, Jay Keeps. How are you? Uh, Kay, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm so good. Okay, so how, let's just start here. How does one become a Super Bowl champion's personal QB coach? Well, actually, it was a unique situation where I was Russell's backup for two years in Seattle, mm -hmm. uh, was on and off the roster and, you know, competing with each other in the meeting room. Um, and obviously, we got very close, got to see 
you know, what I was all about. And I get a random phone call after I'm done and uh, says, hey, I'm putting you on a flight. Come come see me out at UCLA. I didn't know what it was for. And uh, it was to put him through an impromptu workout. And I've been his guy ever since for, for five years now. So, you know, it's been really fun to work with him, to have that close relationship uh, in the off season, in season. Um, and, and we've we've seen a lot of fun times together, a lot of low lights, a lot of highlights. Um, and uh, it's exciting times in Denver right now. And obviously this was a tough loss last night, but uh, they'll bounce back and they'll be better for it. Okay, so what were his emotions like coming into this game? You know, I Honestly, Russell was very calm. Russell was very calm. He was very excited about the opportunity to go back to Seattle. And obviously, you talk about the personal aspect of things, the revenge game, all this kind of stuff. And, and Russell really wasn't in that mindset. It was more about trying to play a clean game, trying to handle mm -hmm. the emotions. He knew the crowd was going to be rowdy. He knew he wasn't going to walk into a, a standing ovation. Uh, and, and he knows Pete Carroll and the way that that organization is run. And so this was going to be a playoff-like environment. And I think understanding that it was going to be that way out of the, out of the gate uh, was really important to try to handle, try to grasp uh, for not just him, but everybody involved. And I think um, ultimately, they didn't handle it as well as they would have liked to, obviously, with the 12 penalties that you mm -hmm. saw. Um, but there's a lot of good stuff to take away from this, K, and a lot to build off of. Tell me what you saw that you liked. What I saw, what I liked, was honestly the running game I thought was really was really good uh, with Melvin Gordon and Javante Adams. Uh, you know, they had over five yards per carry. I really enjoyed seeing that. I thought the protection for most of the night was was fantastic. And, and honestly, you're starting to see some of the connections that develop. You see Jerry Judy play big uh, and come up big in some big moments. Uh, Cortland Sutton, you know, doing a really good job in scramble situations. Those are going to come up big down the road. Uh, Albert O, a, a guy who is taking over for Noah Fant, uh, who's extremely talented. I, I thought he played a fantastic game. You get Javante Adams going in the running game and, and in the passing game. So I thought there was a lot to take away from. And, and honestly, Kay, one of the other things was, you knew that the crowd was going to be crazy. And unfortunately, the Seahawks got up big, and so the crowd stayed in it all game long. You yeah. would have liked to have taken the crowd out from the very jump. That wasn't the case. So you're playing in a playoff environment all the way down to the wire. And I thought that the Broncos, if you look at the second half, the defense settled down, the offense really started to get going, um, and, and really started to take control of but, the game, but take unfortunately. Me into, take me into his head. So you were talking about the booing. He knew, it was, he, knew he had to be calm. He went in there, yeah. tried to execute. There's only so much he can control, of course, and he can't control the 12s, and they were really rambunctious. How does booing af affect him, knowing what you know about him? Because some people use it for fuel. Some people, it gets into their head. How does Russell handle stuff like booing? I, I mean, he, he doesn't take it into account uh, one way or the other, Kay. It, in his mindset, his mindset is all about neutrality. It's not about hmm. trying to overblow the situation. So a lot of people will take uh, the cheering or the booing and, as you said, use it as motivation for Russell. Uh, he is able to do things mentally that I think very few human beings can do, where they can take a lot of the emotion out of the game and they can hmm. just focus on the play moment to moment. And so I know it was emotional in terms of going back and and, and not being in a Seahawks uniform anymore. Uh, he wanted to finish his career there. That was his lifelong goal. Uh, it just wasn't the right thing to do at that time, uh, seeing all of his teammates. But really, Kay, for him, when he gets in game mode, uh, being, a, being a, uh, a, a quarterback in the room with him, on the field with him, he can do things that no other person can, in my opinion, which is quiet all the noise and just really focus on moment to moment. And if you watch him play, uh, he does get hyped in big moments, yeah. but typically he, his affect is very still. And that's because he is really, truly focused on the play, the moment. And he's working through that mentally. I need him to uh, teach he's done me that, that his can entire he, can, career. Do you teach that? Can I, can you, can I work, uh, or, you know, hire you as my quarterback's coach to figure that out? Uh, I don't know if I believe you entirely. Anytime, I, think, I think he's a human being, unless you're telling me he's an actual robot, that things do affect him on some level. It's amazing that he's able to remain disciplined and steady through those moments, though, even though um, I, I can't imagine they don't affect him a little bit, uh, as I can't imagine that this decision at the end of the game isn't going to affect him. And he's an amazing leader. He's an amazing president. 
presence, though he's going to say everything's fine, like Hackett's decision. They took the ball out of this quarterback's hands. They brought in this quarterback to shine in these big moments. Your thoughts on that from Russell Wilson's lens and perspective? I think anytime you're a quarterback, of course, you would like to have the ball in your hands in those moments. Uh, I don't think any quarterback would tell you any differently, Kay. Uh, if you look at the explanation of, of what Hackett gave, what Russell Wilson gave, uh, there's a lot of trust that is put into Brandon McManus there. And, and a lot of people can question that decision. And, and I think uh, when you don't come up with the result, rightfully so. But it, it, they, simp they very much looked to Brandon McManus and said, what's your range? Where are you good from? And he gave that answer to them, and, and they went off of that. So uh, I think that those are moments that you can look back on and reflect, but I think they kept it as simple as that in their thought process. Yeah. And everybody else might not be able to fully understand that when you have Russell Wilson in, in fourth and five and he's driving and, and the defense is tired in that moment. Um, but I think they really kept it as simple as that. Jake Heaps, we appreciate you so much. I'm sure you spoke to Russell Wilson after the game. Did he say anything, or what was his mentality after if you did? Yeah, his mentality after the game really truly is about learning and growing from this moment. I mean, Kay, I don't know if anybody can walk away from the game and say that the Seahawks were truly the better team. When you're 0-4 in the red zone and you don't execute it in the red zone the way that you should, uh, that's the game. It's just simply the game right then and there. And so – there's an unfortunate missed opportunity and Seahawks are, are feeling really good today and, and last night. Um, but there is a whole season to go. And that is what this is all about. Taking the, the learning moments out of these games and progressing and moving forward. And this is a, a franchise in the Denver Broncos who have had a lot of winning, right. but not recently. What do people and get so wrong about? And so how do you take those moments and build off of totally. them? Totally. Well, uh, quickly, what do people get wrong about Russell Wilson? There's, he's, for some reason, very polarizing, especially after last night. It was more apparent than ever. What they get wrong about yeah, him? Yeah. Like um, I, I think that when you talk about, as, as you said, Kay, when you were saying, I don't know if he uh, can really truly do that, if he doesn't get emotional. I think that there's – you know, the buildup leading towards the game. And I think that there is a there's a different mindset w of who he is and how he trains his mind for the game. And I think Russell is really, truly it, who he is, how he portrays himself. And a lot of people doubt that um, for whatever reason, they don't view it as genuine. And, and Russell is a very mm. genuine guy. Um, I think that's number one. Uh, and I think the other thing is, is that, you know, with the discourse that happened in Seattle over the last two years, Kay, I think that there's been some question marks about, you know, is Russell a team guy? And, and I think that uh, if you saw this guy work, if you saw the hours that he put in behind the scenes with his teammates, uh, you know, all those different things, I, I think that everyone would have a very, very different view. I think that there was just uh, over the last two years, you're trying to get figured out yeah. where the best place is for you. Uh, in the next decade of your career. And so it, it got a little yeah. bumpy at the end. A, a little bumpy, but now he's got a, a whole year, like you said, to sort of right the ship, at least in people's perceptions, uh, and figure it out. Thank you so much, Jake Heaps. We appreciate you. Congrats on all the success. And we'll talk to you soon. We will be back on Up and Adams. I've got waiver wire ads for you. Matt Money Smith is in studio. Am I wearing a, what do you call this thing? A, a wetsuit under my clothes right now. I am, in fact. We'll be back. All right. Oh, I love this moment between he and DK. He and Gino Smith will be back after this. Week one is in the books, of course. There were some injuries. You want to tweak your roster a little bit. It's time for something I like to call Pick me up. That's right. Waiver wire grabs. Let me ask you something. Do you know who's only owned and rostered in 3% of leagues right now on NFL.com? Carson Wentz. And hell, pick up Jahan Dotson while you're at it. Wentz looked awfully comfortable on Sunday. 3 to 13 yards, 4 touchdowns, 3rd highest scoring quarterback. He was a top 3 fantasy quarterback this week. What? Behind only Mahomes and Josh Allen. Um, because I love you and because I know you're busy and I'm not and I'm a loser. I looked at the schedule. It looks pretty good. Lions, Eagles, Cowboys up ahead. If you lost one, Dak Prescott, scoop up Wentz. 
Uh, by the way, that's not the only mention of Wentz in the show, so don't worry about that. All right, let's move it along here. Curtis Samuel, yeah, we're staying in Washington, baby. One of his favorite targets on Sunday. Uh, racked up eight catches, 55 yards, 11 targets. He had a touchdown as well. He also ran the ball four times for 17 yards, which we love. He finished top 15 at wide receiver in PPR leagues, and I think if he continues to that, get that kind of volume, and he should, he is worth having on your Wasp Waster on your waster. That's just my Washington peeking through here. All right, Jalen Warren. Okay, here's the deal. Najee, as I pointed out, I'm worried about Najee. Well, listen, he's battling through this Liz Frank. He downplayed it week one. Let's be honest, it's already a concern. So he didn't look right Sunday, 12 touches, just 26 yards. He had to leave the game. You know, there's a report saying he's gonna go. He'll play for the against the Patriots this weekend. I'm gonna just go ahead and say, let's just prepare for the worst case scenario. Scoop up his backup. He's an undrafted rookie, Jalen Warren, out of Oklahoma State. He played on 37% of snaps on Sunday, and I think he's the guy, and he is the guy if Najee does miss time, and I expect him to. All right. More running backs for you because I love you guys. 49ers backfield, let's do it. Jeff Wilson and Tyrion Davis-Price. That's right, not Tyrion. He's not of Westeros fame. Uh, but these are the two guys you want because Elijah Mitchell, of course, slated to miss two months with that sprained MCL. Shanahan loves to run the ball. I don't love playing any of this backfield because of his Shanahanigans that he does uh, in the backfield, but Jeff Wilson started four times last year. Guess what he averaged in yards per game? 73 total and two touchdowns. So third round pick Tyrion Davis-Price out of LSU, uh, inactive Sunday because he doesn't play on special teams, but given that he was the second player on the Niners selected in the draft this April, I think they're probably gonna give him some opportunities at some point. Last but not least, let's go to the Chargers. Why not, shall we? Josh Palmer, this is an easy plug and play. Keenan Allen banged up. Look his way, second year receiver for the Chargers. Quiet week one, but because, you know, Keenan is out, and because of the game that Keenan missed last season where Palmer had five catches for 66 yards and a touchdown on seven targets, he is a must-own in fantasy leagues. <sighs> that felt good. Yeah, so we're going Washington heavy. We got little Jalen Warren insurance for Najee Harris, who I'm worried about. Backfield I'm not th that excited about in San Francisco, but of course one of them's gonna go off. It's never gonna be the one you play. Never that, but at least you can give yourself that migraine. This entire backfield should be sponsored by Excedrin, in my opinion, and Josh Palmer as a wide receiver. All right, we've got more to get to on the show. Up next, some power rankings with one Matt Money Smith. Let me just, oh, let me see. I really like that part of the fantasy football season where I was drafting and full of optimism. Okay, sure, we'll be back. Oh, Los Angeles. I don't love you, at least not yet, but I'm trying to love you. In an effort to do that, we welcome in Matt Money Smith, one of my faves, the voice of the Los Angeles Chargers and the host of Petros and Money on AM570 here in LA. You're a busy man, but you've got time to uh, kick it with me. Yes, I do. And uh, see that out there, the whitewash? That's what we're gonna get you started in. Too many people, they charge the wave, yeah. they get their soft top, they get too deep, they hit the peak, and yeah. next thing you know, they're flipping over and they never wanna swim. You didn't yeah. want me to wear this the entire show thought because you, you thought cook. I'd, I'd cook. Yes. Because it's a two, three, four? It's a three, two, full suit, and it's, uh, but look, you know what, that's your first lesson. Did I put the wetsuit on the right way? And I you think did. I did, you came out, the zipper was in the back. I don't think You're putting good. on a, I do, I'm just a TV professional, and I knew that two minutes and 30 seconds wouldn't be enough to get this bad boy on. So, on my body. All right, here's the deal. Power rankings, upsets this past weekend. Take me through what you got. Yeah, so let's get started with the top one through eight. Not much change here. You have the Bills, the Chiefs, and the Chargers. All of them, dominant offensive performance, dominant defensive performance. That's why they're the top three, even though they're all in the AFC. Ah. The Bucks were dominant defensively. Still a little bit of a question mark uh, in terms of the offense. <laughs> Packers, we don't move them down that much. They lost 38-3 to last year, and they had the best record in the NFC. So you're using last, what happened last year, week one, to prove exactly. this year? Don't freak out, All it's week right, one. Sure. And the Minnesota Vikings are up five, one of our biggest movers of the week in that top quadrant. We get to the uh, the second quadrant there, Kay. And well, you know what, let's just get into the Vikings because uh, they're up five. Justin Jefferson's a cheat code. He's just a straight cheat code. And we know it's an offensive league. And until someone proves they're gonna be able to sh slow him down, Kevin O'Connell there running that that uh, Kyle Shanahan offense. I we call know him an offensive-minded king. That works for me. That's what he is. That's okay. a perfect what way I'm... to end our great conversation great. on the uh, on the Vikings. To the on. second segment here, nine through 16. Okay. Uh, big movers. Look at the Dolphins there, up nine. Our biggest mover of the week. I doubted them, Kay. What was I thinking? Mike McDaniel. 
Mike McDaniel picked up where Brian Flores left off. The offense wasn't great. The yeah. running attack, sub three yards per carry. Too a little shaky. A little bit shaky. But what did he do? He leaned on his defense. He yeah. kept it conservative, used his speed. The Bengals are down four. That offensive line gave up a 10% higher pressure rate than last year's average. I don't see the Steelers yet. You don't see the Steelers what? yet, but you're going to see them right okay, now. Okay, let's see. As we shift to the uh, to the third board, you will see the Steelers. This is the thing about Mike Tomlin, right? Like, it is ridiculous what he does. We count him out. Mitch Trubisky is your quarterback. The offensive line's a mess. Now, they're at 21. Why? They sacked Joe Burrow seven times. They picked him off four and they still probably should have lost that game. They just beat the AFC champions and you bumped them up two spots? I did because they should have lost that game. It was a hurt long snapper that led to bad snaps, and yet the Bengals were in position to win that game. Steelers as fans are going to crush you. All they right, are. well, let's go to the next page. The next Not page. The ne we'll yeah, there we go. As, oh, this is our uh, last page. There's your Bears. Look at them. They're up four. I had them at the 32 spot. They are now up to number 28. Talk to me. Well, it was a monsoon, so you don't want to put too much stock into it. It was a real messy game. Now, what I did like about their performance was yeah. Matt Eberflus, he eased in Justin Fields. Hey, let's not get crazy. Yes, you're getting beat up by this defensive front, but we're not going to overreact. And by the end of the game, Justin Fields made plays. He made winning plays. And I think that goes a long way for a young quarterback's confidence with a new uh, coaching staff. This is staff. literally the most uncomfortable thing I've ever heard. It's choking me. Yes. What is the point of that? And then you have to get in the water and yes. peel it off of your body. And well, after awful. you get out. But awful. you know what? Like I said, the first, look, the first lesson is a wild success, Kay, because you put the wetsuit on the right way, the zipper's in the back. LA, You're good. here I come. You are great. Uh, talk to me about the Vikings. You have them over the Eagles. I don't know that I would do that. I well, think the Eagles were really impressive. Gritty win. What do you got? The defense let them down. The offense was exceptional. One of the best offensive performances we saw the week. Love what Nick Sirianna and Shane Steichen are doing with Jalen Hurts. However, defensively, they allowed the Lions to hang out. And I don't know how elite that Lions offense is. So when I think about that meeting, look, it's Vikings-Eagles. We yeah. get it. So we're going to get that head-to-head -head this week. So the biggest riser was the Dolphins, as yes. you said. The biggest faller was the, the Cowboys. Cowboys. Yeah, down 12. Look, Dak did not look great. I think the biggest issue is why are you trying Trading Amari Cooper. He was on an affordable contract. He was their number one receiver. It allowed CD yeah. to be the two, Gallup to be the three. Now all of those kind of shift. CD's got to be the one, Gallup's got to be the two, and it just doesn't look like it worked. It was four and a half yards per attempt. It was a mess. Riddle me this. How would a Jimmy G uh, acquisition change your Cowboys projection for next week? I, well, I think um, that there's still the wide receiver issue, you know, and and I look, I don't think it's a, a Dak. I think Dak wasn't great, but we know he's the centerpiece. <laughs> I'm suffocating <of> <laughs> This. Well, what? I said it when I, I do, came. I was like, wait a minute, she got a full wrong? wetsuit? What did she do? Um, but you're, you're learning. Stand. You're learning how to move because you got to uh, paddle in that thing. you got to get used to the neoprene and um, at you're least. The, you're the voice of the, the cool shoes. Oh, thank you, my Aquabats fans. Yes, uh, Orange County Punk Rock. We love Chris. MC Bat Commander, not Christian. Uh, Will you just Aquabats. make me cool? I'm completely out of uh, okay, I'm, fish I'm out of water. On, <laughs> I'm leaning on you to uh, to make me cool. Uh, Thursday Night Football, big one for you. Huge. Uh, look, the Chargers defense did what they spent $215 million to do, and that's dominate a game after letting games get away all yep. last year. Khalil Mack was all business. He is no joke, and uh, he let everybody know that with three sacks, including the one that ended the game. <laughs> My poor Bears. I am happy for him, though. Yes. He was awesome. Yeah. Um, um, I will ask you, Josh Palmer, I had as my way Love wire at. So remember, Keenan was out last year for one game. Five catches on seven targets. There you go. See, Kay, you're making me. All right. You're making me uh, look cool. Let's um, surf out into the, what do you want me, what do you want to teach me here? Okay. Um, let's do it like every week. Okay. Let's do a little surfing so, 101 lesson. So listen, we don't have to do I anything. I look like I'm at PacSun and I'm trying to like <laughs> entice people and teenagers to come in. There you go. To the mall and like try Buy on a rash short guard, shorts. Get some board shorts. Some we're like not going to do wax. nothing mechanical today. Okay. Um, but what we're going to do is again, tip of the cap to you for putting the wetsuit on the right way. Uh, you bought the right wetsuit. A three two can be used year round. By the way, make a cool wetsuit because like they're all just black. You just look like a seal out there waiting yeah. to be eaten. You got a nice pattern. I want to be a I want to be a, a highlighter out there. You okay. look great Continue. with the uh, the flowers. Hey. So the other thing is, look behind it. Look in the uh, monitor here. See that? See that crashing wave behind us? Yeah. That's where you want to start. Too many beginners try to paddle out and they want to get into a wave and they want to catch a line and get in the pocket and they get We're not dusted. Get up and surf? Go ahead. <laughs> well, here. I mean, well, then you got to get on your stomach and you got to really? kind of. Uh, yeah, so you got to get on your stomach. We'll be back after this. And you got to arch your back. Boys. So get your back. Get your back.
Dip it. Kate, get your hands here, right here. Okay, right here. go. And I then you do your burpee, never right? Never and then you kind of. You know what I was thinking of? What's that? I was like, let me make a bet with him, and then I'll, if when I lose, like, I'll go in the water. Done. And I thought it through, and I was like, absolutely not. No, you're going. Radio boys for go. the LA Chargers, Matt Money Smith, uh, crush him with the power rankings. Good form. I look Good cool. Form. I look so cool. Bye. Bye. Listen, let me tell you about FanDuel Casino while I take off his wetsuit. Uh, it's a new daily game. Jeff Schwartz joining us in a little bit. It's free to play. Uh, Reward Machine is a free game that gives players the chance to win up to $2,000 in casino bonus every day. All you gotta do is log in daily and spin for a free chance at rewards. FanDuel wants you to win. Play Reward Machine for a free chance at every day. Day wins over at FanDuel Casino. Let's bring in Jeff Schwartz, shall we? He's a Cali boy. He was born and raised in Santa Monica. This is not pleasant. The point of the wetsuit is you take it off when you're wet, and it comes off much easier uh -oh. when it's dry. That's 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 why. Now I'm too big to wear one. I'm just. I think Jeff, it is, but I know listen, how they work. Jeff Schwartz in a wetsuit is a segment that needs to happen. That's what I think. I'm in. Let's do uh, it. You, on, are, you are an NFL veteran. You are a, uh, an analyst when it comes to these games. You are a sports betting enthusiast as well. So I'm going to take you through some matchups and tell me yeah. what your thoughts are and who you are taking particular interest in, my friend. Thursday night, just talked to the voice of the Chargers about it, too. Uh, a couple of real high-powered offenses, my friend. Who do you got? Chargers Chiefs. Um, I got Kansas City in this game, even though I probably would take the Chargers if it's at three and a half just to cover. Here's the thing about uh, about San Diego. Well, Los Angeles, I guess the Chargers now, is that like they always leave me some, wanting a little bit more, right? Like the game on Sunday, they should have blown out the Raiders. But in the end, the Raiders had the ball driving down the field to go win that game. Kansas City did not leave me wanting more after week one. Yeah. 44 points. Mahomes looked great as expected. But more importantly, the defense is so much better this season. Now, they're without Trent McDuffie, most likely. The rookie corner who played well. But the pass rush is so much better. Chargers without Keenan Allen in this game, most likely, as well. So injuries kind of even out. And I'll go with Kansas City in this matchup. But I think the Chargers do cover this game. But I would take the Chiefs straight up. Justin Herbert is 2-2 two two in his career against Mahomes. Both losses coming in overtime. So real close, but you're making great points there. The Bucks are at the Saints. Saints beat them twice last year. Do you like the Saints' chances? No, they have Jameis Winston at quarterback, and we saw them struggle against Atlanta. I just think they're not as good this season. I think people put too much stock, um, or not enough stock, I should say, in, in, in the fact that they lost a Hall of Fame head coach and a Hall of Fame quarterback. And I don't really put much into them, you know, coming back into Atlanta. Atlanta always does this. It's at the MO of, mm. of the Falcons, and the Falcons might be the worst team in the NFL this season. So uh, I like the comeback great. Tampa Bay did not play particularly well, especially in the red zone against the Cowboys, but their defense is fierce. Their defense is yeah. really good. I think Jameis struggles in this game. I'll take Tampa to play better on offense. They win this game on the road and cover. You can say what you want about Jameis and call him all the names in the book, Schwartz. It doesn't change the fact that he is 6-2 and two as a Saints starter. Six and two, sure. and now he's got, sure. he went from a absolutely crap fest. I don't know why I just said, I've literally <laughs> never said crap fest in my entire life. I don't know what that means. Uh, he went from a bottom of the barrel, if you will, receiver room with all the injuries and issues to one that's one of the most exciting ones in the league. Olave turned up, Jarvis Landry uh, making some key plays in big spaces. All right, Tua and Lamar go head to head in Baltimore. Ooh, this is a good one. Who you got? Um, I'm going to ride with the Ravens continually probably each week, man. They're just a tough team to play against oh, yeah. because of their style of offense. And unfortunately, they've had more injuries, left tackle again, uh, uh, one of their corners again out for the season. Um, and they started very slow against the Jets, but played much better in the second half of that game. The Dolphins, look, I get it. There's hype around them, but they were okay this weekend against a bad Patriots team, only 20 points. You know, efficient, I get that. They had a fourth down, a, a long one on fourth down there to, to waddle. But I'm riding with the Ravens until not. I just like the Ravens team, their makeup, Harbaugh, Lamar Jackson. Uh, I don't love the three and a half, though. That hook is scary. I would advise you to never take a three and a half or seven and a half. That scares anyone anytime. But I would take the Ravens in this spot early on Tuesday. Now, the Dolphins beat the Ravens 22 to 10 a year ago. That, of course, the game that's, uh, you know, where the season started to slip away from Baltimore. Bengals take on the Dak list. Cowboys. Interesting one. Yeah. Yeah. Again, the seven and a half isn't great here uh, for the Bengals, but that has to be the side in this situation. Uh, five turnovers on Sunday and almost won the game. You can make the argument they should have won the game. So they played their worst game of probably the season, a stinker, and still had a chance to beat a, a Steelers team there that uh, really couldn't do much on offense. Look, look at the Cowboys. Even before Dak went out of that game, what where's the offense at? Like you had all offseason to come up with this. 
And I understand there's issues at offensive line, issues at, 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 yeah. at wide receiver, but now you don't even have Dak in there. I think the Bengals have a big get right game this weekend. Cowboys really struggle. And uh, this one's not close. I think the Bengals win this one. I mean, it's a, it's a public play as can be, but they win this one by three touchdowns. Listen, I heard a lot about this new look offensive line. You're the per perfect person to ask to. How concerned should I be with what we saw from the Bengals on Sunday? The Steelers' defensive line is really good. <laughs> and that's part of it. I mean, what Wall was able to do. And, and there is some concern. They look like an offensive line that took no reps together in the preseason. Zero reps together the entire mm. preseason. I do not understand teams doing this, especially with new offensive lines and trying to find guys to Joe, Guess who plays their starters all preseason? Kansas City does. And they mm -hmm. start fast every single season. Maybe that's the reason why. So I think they're going to take time with reps. They're going to be fine. Burrow takes a ton of sacks. It's kind of his thing now. It wouldn't be my thing if I was a quarterback. Yeah. Um, um, he needs to get the ball out. They need to design an offense to get the ball out quicker. So it's not all in the offensive line. <laughs> Such a perfect thing for you to say as an offensive lineman. As, first of all, you would never say it if you were an active offensive lineman. You would say you, you're... <laughs> yes, we need to block better. Yes, and what, an, what an NFL vet thing to say of like, oh, when I, back when I played, we played four preseason games and did two. I was throwing up on the side. Are you hearing yourself? It, look, look, look at this past weekend. Look who started slow on offense. No, all the teams did not play any starters at all in the preseason. Yeah. I, I'm not saying you have to play them the entire preseason, but look, the Rams, the Ravens, the Bengals, yeah. all these teams that played no, the Packers, and the Packers have other issues as well. They all started yeah. slow. There's yeah. a reason you need a little bit of live reps in the preseason. I will never come off of that take. I like, I like the take, especially with the O-line. Great matchup in Philly. Wow, this is a hell of a game here. Vikings, Eagles. Yeah. Man, this is this is great. Um, you know, Philadelphia, they have all the pieces, right? Offensive, defensive lines. They obviously upgraded a wide receiver. They got better at cornerback. Um, but the Vikings, and I, I know the Packers had their issues, but they did the same thing, right? Good up front, made enough plays with Jefferson. Cousins does just enough each week, it feels like. Uh, a little disrespected at times with, with how good he is. Um, I would probably lean... Who, this is the toughest one so far of the week. I mean, this is, would be a stay away in my personal life. Um, I would lean <laughs> ever so slightly to Minnesota here. Um, kind of just, I think, all around better team at the moment, better quarterback. In Philly? With her, in Philly, yeah. I, the home field advantage thing in, in the NFL is not as big of a deal anymore. I mean, teams win on the road all the time. It's not It's not as big of a concern, in my opinion, as college. College is still a thing. NFL, yeah. not so much. Tell that to Russell Wilson last night. What are you talking about? That's a whole other story. But the fumbling of his running backs had nothing to do with them playing in Seattle. So, and, and his coach's decision to kick a 64-yard field goal had nothing to do with them playing in Seattle. He thought he was in Denver. So, yeah. um, the, that had nothing to do with the game last night. Why does the, the, yeah. Why does the one-yard line hate Russell Wilson? I don't know. And the Broncos offense was really good. They averaged like seven yards of play. I, I think that people will look at this result and think that one team, Seattle, um, played well. And they played well at times, but they allowed a ton of yards and didn't play very well in offense in the second half. Where Denver played well, had bad turnover luck. Yeah, what a weird game. I can't wait to see what happens. Week two. Such an emotional one. You almost have to throw it away and see what happens. I'm here for it either way. Geno Smith, one a great storyline. If he crushes it the whole way through, I would be amazed. And if Russell Wilson bounces back, of course, and leads his team to the playoffs, that would be great, too. Uh, you have two quick, bold predictions yes. for us. Hit me. Well, I had this before the season. I feel like I, I'm even stronger on this. Denver did not make the playoffs. I, I don't quite understand the excitement around a first-time head coach who, when given his <laughs> own offense in Jacksonville, was not very good. And we saw last night, again, a bunch of errors on this team, coaching malpractice at the end of the game. And they're in a super tough division with, guess what, the best coaching quarterback operation in the NFL, mm -hmm. a young up-and-coming coach in Brandon Staley with an incredible quarterback in Herbert. I think Carr is underrated. We know McDaniels can coach, obviously not so well in his first head coaching stint. I never got this, this Denver hype, in my opinion, and last night kind of proved to me they're just not ready to be a playoff team. The other one that I saw today that I'm kind of surprised by, Andy Reid for Coach of the Year is plus 4,000. Plus 4,000, guys. Coach of the Year goes to most often coaches that win 11, 12, 13, 14 games and kind of, you know, good storylines. What better storyline than Tyreek Hill's gone, everyone didn't think we were good, and Mahomes throws for 5,000 yards, we win 13 or 14 games, and we're the one seed again. Like, to me, plus 4,000 feels like a great value for a coach who we know is going to win 11, 12, 13 games. 
It's well said, great analysis by you, and I think I learned a little in that segment, which is what we want as I'm being introduced into this world yes. of sports betting. Jeff Schwartz, I am sweating my day balls off, so I got <laughs> to get out of here. We appreciate you, and we'll talk to you a little Good bit later. On. Listen, I'm going to shed some light on some uh, unheralded performances or some things that I really love from week one to wrap up the show after this. Honestly, I'm, <laughs> I'm dying. Matt Money Smith was right. Don't wear wetsuits in studios under hot lights. So, I mean, who knew? Who knew? Did I buy a car yet? Of course I didn't. So I will invite you to take a shot at some free prizes like this bad boy. Take a look at this, FanDuel and GMC. All you gotta do is answer questions about this week's action on the gridiron. The more you get right, the higher you move up the mountain. It's like the Price of the Right game with the mountain goat thing. Remember what I'm talking about? Yeah. Bob Barker days? I don't know. All right, it's the GMC Sierra Mountain Climber, uh, and you can win it, and you can reach the summit. If you do, you can get a share of $10,000 in prizes. All the details over at fanduel.com to enter. So the week is wrapped, uh, and there are some things we didn't really get to talk about, some, some performances that sort of get swept under the rug. They were brilliant performances that deserve the Hollywood-like spotlight. So uh, it's called Hit the Lights. Uh, I asked for a ton of nominations, and so we had a lot of those come in. Saquon Barkley. That's a, that's a really good one. It's very hard to not give him this award from an emotional perspective. This is someone who embraces adversity uh, and all of that. So we love ourselves some Saquon Barkley. Uh, that's a good one. I got a lot of Justin Reed. Uh, Conrad, we'll bring you on here. Uh, do you like the Justin Reed choice here? How do you not like Justin Reed here? It's for the Are brand. the voice of God now? What's happening? Where is Conrad? <laughs> What's, I'm sorry? Are you just, okay, you're not going to be, oh, there you are. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm right here. It, it, it is the voice of God, but who wouldn't love Justin Reed? What did I tell you about that background? Uh, of course, yeah, him doing what he, what he did. Then we have Khalil Mack, which, of course, yes. three sacks. We loved that. That was great. But the winner, I'm going to say, and you guys didn't, I feel like the production staff wasn't behind me on this one. It's Carson Wentz. Yes, okay. Carson, Carson Wentz. Wentz hit the lights, hit the spotlight on this character. 313 yards and four touchdowns in his commander's debut. His first game there against the Jaguars. The latest chapter in, honestly, what might be the most unique path we've ever seen from a quarterback. And before I get any stupid tweets about, well, it was the Jaguars. Just remember how a season ended last year. That devastating loss, week 18, you know, they were knocked out of the playoff picture by said Jag. So this was a different looking Carson Wentz. It's something to keep your eyes on and we should definitely respect the fact that he fits in that offense, the RPOs, the trust in that talented group of receivers. Carson Wentz, hit the lights.